Hey guys, Static here, and today on Dungeon Guide we're going to be covering Veteran Hard Mode Ruins of Mazatoon. This is one of the longer, more time consuming dungeons to complete. One of the main focuses of today's guide will be to showcase just how quickly you can complete this dungeon by using skips. If you or a party member had picked up a quest at the beginning of this dungeon, you'll have to clear the mob to the left here, otherwise you can just keep moving past it. In fact, in this first section, the only mob you have to face is the very last one in the entire area. I like Mazatune, because rather than just copy and pasting mobs from other dungeons, they've introduced entirely new creatures for us to encounter. The insects in these mobs are kind of non-factors. They don't do a lot of damage, but when they die, they do split into smaller insects, becoming a swarm. The two-handed enemies with the funny hats just basically do light and heavy attacks. The heavy attack, however, will knock you back. The real interesting enemies here are these Hajmotos. First of all, they're going to be the last enemies that die, just because they have insane resistances. Their attacks include sticking their front half in the ground and ripping them up out of the ground to send out tremor shockwaves in multiple directions, and also burying their entire body under the ground and doing a charge attack, knocking back anyone in their path. Realistically, these enemies won't be much of a threat for most groups. They're just going to be time consuming due to the amount of damage that they don't take. Fun fact, neither of the Hiss dungeons have any unique named item drops. This first boss really isn't too difficult. For the most part, it's a tank and spank. He does introduce us to a new important mechanic though, and we will be dealing with it for the rest of the dungeon. He has spinning heavy attacks which your tank wants to block, but then he goes up in the air and comes back down with the smash. You want to stay out of that. This brings us to the Stone Shaper mechanic. He stands in one place and summons these rocks from all over. It's a good idea to just hold block during this phase, as it's randomly targeted and it hurts quite a bit. They also knock you to the ground if they go unblocked. That's all this boss brings to the table. I think he more or less was just placed in here to introduce the new mechanics, so you'll be more familiar with them later in the dungeon. Here our group is going to attempt a big boy pull. If you don't have the DPS or the heals for this, don't attempt it. Do one room at a time. However, if you have the big numbers, go ahead and pull both rooms back into this tiny little section here and burn them all down together using line of sight. It's much quicker. One of the mobs from the second room looks familiar. This sword and board ad is exactly like that first boss. He does spinning attacks and he also does the stone shaper. The difference here is if your tank is a DK, they can use chains to grab the mob and pull them towards them to interrupt the stone shaping. For this reason, it's a good idea if you're the DPS or the healer to make sure you don't have any CCs in your toolkit to make sure that the tank can interrupt them when they need to. Here in the next room, we're introduced to the spice mechanic. One player steps into this pool of green goop, it removes all of your stamina, and you need to run it to the geyser to remove it from you. The mud crabs that appear snare and damage you. When you get too snared, use your synergy button to drop the spice for the next member of the party to grab it. Once the spice is washed off, all the mud crabs disappear. Once again, this will be an important mechanic later on in this dungeon. The first thing you'll notice in this fight is that Chudan will summon Hajmotos. For the most part, I would say you could just ignore these ads, just because they're not worth the time it takes to take them down. Watch out for their mechanics though, as I get knocked down by one of theirs right here. We'll get back to these poison rings on the ground, because right now there's a mage up. Chudan will lock on to one player. You'll get two rings around your feet, an outer and an inner. When the inner reaches the outer, he will charge at you. You need to point this at the mage. You can do this by being in front of or behind the mage, and you can dodge roll at the last second, or just block through it. The mage puts out damage to the entire group. If you miss an opportunity to kill a mage, the damage will become more severe with time and probably overwhelm your group. This poison phase puts out a lot of damage in particular to your tank. If you have access to a reflect, it really helps here, otherwise a couple dodge rolls will keep you safe. It's really easy to be so focused on the mage and the poison mechanics that you don't notice just how many adds have arrived. These adds can apply a lot of pressure to your group, so I suggest trying to take out the archers as those are the ones that are the most threatening. If your healer can deal with keeping your party up through these adds, don't worry about them. Just keep hammering on Chudan. If they're a problem though, definitely start to take them out as it can be too much to handle for a lot of people. This fight really centers around making sure you're not standing in the poison and definitely taking out these mages. That's priority number one. 
You can skip the mobs in the next room by either sneaking or sprinting quickly along this wall on the left. Now comes the part of the dungeon that everyone hates the most, the arena. This section is very time consuming because there are several waves of ads that need to be defeated in order to advance to the next area and there's no way to speed this process up. Or is there? Little known fact, that's right, another skip. It takes a bit of practice to get the hang of, but using this tree root allows you to scale this ledge and go around the gate to move on to the next section without having to defeat a single enemy. This next section is huge and filled with a ton of enemies. Do we have to fight them? No. No we don't. We can skip every enemy in this entire area once again. This skips so many mobs I almost feel bad telling you about it. Follow my path exactly and you shouldn't aggro a single enemy. The trickiest part is at the end here where you have to split the difference between these two trolls and jump over this post. Do this one at a time in your group and you shouldn't aggro either of them. Do we have to fight the mobs in this next section? No. You have two options here. You can just sneak carefully up through the middle to the end without aggroing anything or you can just have everyone run to the top of the stairs, die, res, and go through the door. Of course, if you're trying to go for a no death run, you're gonna want to do the sneak method. You would also want to move one at a time through the mobs. Here we have another boss fight that groups make a lot harder than it needs to be. Your tank has a large responsibility for interrupting this charge attack. He also has this conal attack that your tank will try and point away from the group. If you are in his immediate vicinity when he does this roar you will get feared. Furthermore he is picking a target and he will charge at them and knock them over. The trick here is that the tank can interrupt this charge even if he's behind him by holding block and being inside of his red circle as he starts to charge. The boss also has a large AoE smash that you want to stay out of. Notice these large lizard dog looking things that are being held back by their handlers. It's important that these lizards get released by killing their handlers during the spice phase. When he gets this red smoke coming off of him he's about to lay down some spice. During this phase, the boss takes no damage. The reason you release the lizards is because they run around and eat all of the archers during this phase. In most scenarios, you'll need to work it out between two party members to carry this spice to the geyser which is located on either end of the room at random. You will likely get so snared from the mud crabs that you will need to drop the spice and your second member will have to grab and carry it the rest of the way. I get lucky here and the close geyser is activated, removing the need for the second player's assistance. Once the spice reaches the geyser, the boss shouts a mighty roar and is damageable once again. This also summons a troll. You want to really focus on this troll as it can heal itself and the boss, so burn it down quick. You will need to complete three spice phases before this boss is defeated. Nothing changes with the mechanics throughout the entire fight. It's just about completing them three times and being consistent. This room takes a while to clear and there's no quick way to do it or any way to skip it. There is an achievement tied to this calendar in the middle of the room. All around you'll find prisoners in cages with release switches in front of them. In order to complete the achievement you need to match the picture on the calendar with the correct switch. Each time you release a prisoner a wave of mobs will come, defeat them and then move on to the next switch. If everyone in group already has the achievement just go ahead and open up the switches at random. Before entering the last boss area, don't forget to activate hard mode by destroying these alchemical notes. In my opinion, hard mode Mazatun is the single most intense and demanding 4 man dungeon fight in the game. There are a lot of mechanics here and it's extremely unforgiving. Sprinkle in a bit of RNG for good measure and you are in for a difficult piece of content to clear. The hardest aspect of this fight is resource management. There will be totems that pop up at the absolute worst possible moments that your party must 100% focus. These totems are going to drain your resources very quickly. So save potions and synergies for these totems, but even more importantly, drop your ultimates on them. This is rule number one. See a totem, destroy the totem. No exceptions. The next most threatening factor in this fight are the adds, the stone shapers in particular. The boss will place an orange pool of amberplasm on the ground. One player will need to step into this. It does place a dot on you, but if an ad, say that stone shaper, gets to this pool before you, they now take less damage, and more importantly, they are now CC immune. This is huge trouble for you and your party if your tank can't use chains, fossilize, or some other source of hard CC to interrupt their rock phase. 
Twice during this fight, the boss is going to summon Amber Plasm versions of bosses you previously fought. They share the same mechanics they did when you first encountered them. Things start to get really interesting with the statue phase. One player at random will have their entire skill bar reduced to a single fireball attack. You will notice that every statue in the room gets this yellow glow around it. Your other party members only see one glowing statue and can show you which is the correct one you need to destroy with your fireballs to end this phase and regain your skill bar. The statues also shoot meteors all over the place, so you really want to mitigate the length of time spent during this phase. On non-hard mode, you call out that you have statues and your party can point at the target statue and hit their synergy key to reveal to you which is the correct one. On hard mode, there is no synergy. Your group just has to move towards the statue signifying your target. It's not a bad idea to stay grouped up during the statue phase anyways, because you never know when the totem will appear. If one member of the party is across the map, it's possible for it to appear at their location making it nearly impossible to destroy the totem before running out of resources. Furthermore, if your healer is the lucky one who got elected for statue duty, your party would want to come together anyways and use secondary healing methods such as Vigor due to your healer not being able to fill this role. While fighting the second Amberplasm boss, I highly recommend slowing down and making sure everyone has their resources and ultimates topped off prior to defeating him. Once the main boss is active, you are going to be very close to execute phase where you will need everyone throwing everything they have at her to finish this fight. This is where things get very crazy. You're going to have one member on statues along with the adds, and you really need to focus down the stone shapers immediately because the last totem is about to appear. This is the single most important totem of the fight to destroy because you really need your resources to finish her off. So make sure all ultimates are dropped here. Now comes execute phase. The boss will start to shoot vines out in every direction and they hurt quite a bit, so it's imperative you stack on her to make your healer's job easier. Just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, someone is going to get hit with statue duty at this point. Pray to R and Jesus that it's not your healer. If your group has enough DPS to finish her off quick, execute phase isn't that big of a deal. However, if you have low DPS, not only will more adds be forming throughout execute phase, but another totem may drop. Talk about having a bad day. This fight is pretty insane, but if you learn the mechanics and focus on communication within your group, it's totally doable and feels great when you accomplish the seemingly impossible. Thanks for checking out the video guys. Please smash that like and subscribe button below for future content releases. I really appreciate the support everybody's been showing me, so I want to just say thank you to each and every one of you. It really means a lot to me. See you guys later and catch you next time.